Before we begin our lesson review for this week, let us bow heads for prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be alive. Thank you for your words. As we review this week's lesson, we pray that you guide our minds and our hearts and help us to understand your words and live them out in our daily lives. Be with the viewers who will join us this morning and help us to receive your blessing from the study of your words, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome to this week's lesson review. We hope that as we review the lesson, you'll learn something new. You'll find the information written in this week's lesson informative and life-changing. With us today, we have Pastor Bain, the pastor of Elam Seventh-day Adventist Church in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he will take us through the lesson experience for this week. It's the first lesson of the second quarter in 2020. And it's entitled, How to Interpret the Scriptures. And for this week's lesson, the title is, for Sabbath, The Uniqueness of the Bible. Welcome, Pastor. Thank you for having me, Dane. Definitely. So, we have 66 books written over 1,500 years ago on three continents, the Bible. Emperors have tried to destroy this book. Philosophers have tried to stamp it out. Um, people who don't believe in the Bible will tell you, or people who are not Christians, who are not religious, will tell you that the Bible says what information can you give us to shed light on the fact that the Bible is indeed unique? The, the Bible is unique because it is the only book that I know of that tells us with unerring accuracy what happened in our past, what's happening right now in our present, and even projects to the future. The Bible is that book that is literally God's word to human beings. Mm -hmm. What makes it unique is that God decided that he would use human beings coming from all different walks of life to give other human beings his word. Right. That is beautiful to think of, that God would use humans mm -hmm. to tell other humans what his word really is. It tells me that God has a, 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 a big heart that he would want to include those of us who are on this earth in telling each other about his love, his truth. And then it is the book uh, that is the living word of God. And I want that to, to, to sink in. Uh, uh, Sabbath's lesson talked about that. The living word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, God's word is literally life. And so when we read the Bible, it is unique in that it is a book that gives us life and light. I like the lesson studies a uh, 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 key text, memory text. It's really brilliant. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Mm -hmm. If we don't have the word of God, we are in darkness. Yes. Yes. And so it's unique in that no other book in the entire world can give us both light and life like the Bible can. Wow, that's, that's really profound. So you alluded to it just now. There are people who will say the Bible was written by men, so I'm not going to follow it. It's not God's word. What would you tell such a one? Well, I would say to such a one, you are uh, uh, sorely mistaken. Mm -hmm. The word of God is God breathed. In other words, God breathed his word into human beings in order for them to give that word to those of us 
who live on the earth. So here we go. We see it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And I want to read it here from the New International Version. It kind of gives it a real punch. Right. It says here, all scripture is God breathed. That's important. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so a person who sees the Bible as just some other book really doesn't understand the fact that it is God breathed. The same words here I can see in practical terms being lived through God when he actually breathed into Adam. Adam was a form of matter. And then the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 1, I believe around verse 26 thereabout, it says, and God breathed into Adam the breath which is life. Right. Note that. Not the breath of life. The breath which is life. And then man became a living being. That's really important. So the words that these Bible writers wrote are not their words, but the word of God. The word of God. Amen. That is a smooth transition to Sunday. Mm -hmm. The living word of God. And we see a few texts at work here. John 1, 1 to 5. This describes Jesus was in the beginning, before the beginning began to begin. <laughs> and I love that text because it's, it's just profound. And we have John 14, verse 6, which says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. But, but by me. So, what should we take from John 1, 1 to 5? One of my favorite uh, uh, texts of scripture to, to exegete. Um, John writes the word in a different context than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right. He looks at the word Christ as coming from eternity. You alluded to it. Mm -hmm. He starts out his book by saying, in the beginning was the word. Right. The definite article there is really uh, missing when you look at it in the original language. It's not in the beginning, it's really in beginning. Because John knew something. He knew that if we place the definite article the before the word beginning, then it meant that the word began to begin at a point in time. We cannot tie God down to time. God is from eternity. And so it's important for us to realize that whenever beginning began, the word was already present. Wow. Wow. The, 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 word, the word predates beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it will post-date ending. And so we see a God that was always present. And watch this. When we come to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the word was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ellen White, one of my favorite authors, puts it this way. She says that Jesus Christ was the active agent in the creative process, working together with his Father and the Holy Spirit. They created this world. 
The theos, the logos, and the pneumatos came together and out of the chaos created the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So we have the entire world created by God himself. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says something. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And then the story continues. And God said, let there be light. To say is word. So God spoke a word from the very beginning, which tells us that God himself had to have been present. So we have Genesis 1, and God said, let there be light, and God said, and God said, and God said. It's all through the creation story. So we have there the word that's spoken and active. But when we get over to John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 5, and then verse 14, we don't just have the word spoken and active, but we have the word revealed in the flesh. <laughs> so we have before us uh, 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 not only the word active, but we have the word present in the flesh. And then when we go to Revelation now, we see the word coming through in a prophetic manner. And we have there the means of interpretation, how the word comes from God uh, uh, to uh, Jesus to the uh, uh, angel, from the angel to John, from John to the church. And so we have then now the prophetic word in the book of Revelation. And so we have the word coming through in various ways. But it's all the same exact word. And I'm so happy that the word written is the same word that we garner from the one who was from beginning to the one who became flesh to the one who gave it as prophecy, this word of God, the Bible. The consistent word. Amen. Somebody may be watching, Pastor, looking at the title, The Living Word, The Living Word of God. The Bible is the written word, but how is it living? The, the word of God is living in this sense. Jesus lives in me through his spirit. And as he lives in me, that living word that lives in me prompts me to the written word. And they connect because they cannot be in contradiction with one another. And so, because he lives in me, I go to this word and I see what he is revealing to me. He in me, his word in me, and then by my fruit, everybody will know that this word is living in me. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, uh, the Bible makes it clear uh, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. All of these come together to show the world that we have the living word inside of us. So this word is not just theory. Right, this right. word is practical. practical. That's what Jesus meant when he said in John 14 and verse number 6, he said to uh, some bewildered disciples who were concerned that their master was leaving them, one named Thomas, who didn't believe in his own mama. He was the one who said, Lord, how can we know the way? 
And then Jesus said, I am the way. In other words, I have lived among you for these years, teaching you, showing you by my lifestyle what it is to be a Christian, what it is to walk in my ways. And because of this fact, you now can go and live the same way I lived. I am the way, the truth and the life. I tell people all the time that truth is not a collection of uh, 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 data that's uh, used to uh, place in libraries or in uh, museums. No, truth is a person. And that is Jesus Christ. If I have him, I have truth. If I don't have him, I don't have truth. Amen. Profound thoughts. Let's move on to Monday. Who wrote the Bible and where? So this, this day's lesson is very intriguing. The Bible is dynamic based on the circumstances under which it was written. Pastor outlined three circumstances where Bible writers were in other circumstances. In other words, you know, people just didn't sit in their homes and God said, go write that. So give us some examples of, 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 of how these writers got their inspiration. Uh, uh, many times the Bible writers got inspiration from their historical uh, um, lives. These, these Bible writers lived in a real world. Mm -hmm. And so the history of the Bible is just as important as the theology of the Bible. In other words, both must shake hands. There should be no social distancing <laughs> there, okay? They must work together in order to come up with the right construct mm -hmm. and context of scripture. So many times, uh, these Bible writers literally got inspiration from the things that were happening uh, right around them. For instance, we looked at Jesus. Jesus oftentimes told stories based on what was actually happening right around him. The ones who wrote after Jesus left, Peter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, all of them were gathering information from what Jesus did in his life here on earth. Things that they saw, things that they lived. Remember the Apostle Paul. He was writing from jail cells many times. And he was in those unique situations and circumstances. Yet, God breathed his word into him. When we go to the Old Testament, you have a number of Bible writers who wrote under uh, a very challenging circumstances. David. Mm -hmm. David wrote the, the word of God many times hiding in caves from people. Uh, he wrote the word of God uh, sometimes on the uh, uh, verdant grain. Uh, he, he, he penned songs of, of praise unto God. So, so these Bible writers wrote in unique ways, in, in, in different circumstances, and oftentimes it came from where they were. Then, many times they got prophetic words directly from God. And we must realize uh, 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 what we're talking about here. Uh, the prophetic word, and I think we're going to come to that later yes, on, yes. Right? but the prophetic word of God uh, comes in two basic ways. Uh, the seer and uh, the one who was the prophetess, the one who stood up and spoke forth what God had said. So the uniqueness of that is that God spoke directly to them in their circumstances, and even when they came out of vision sometimes, they wrote based on what they saw and related what they saw to their circumstances right around them. And so we have here the word of God coming through in many different shapes and forms based on the context that the writer was writing in. Amen. And no doubt these writers had various circumstances, different thoughts, different minds, different background. But the word that they penned 
in the Bible, when we read today, it's sink. It's sink. It does not go contrary to each other, even though the circumstances were different. Different, and they were in different places and so on. Uh, and I like the way uh, Ellen White put this here uh, in the book Selected Messages, book 1, page 26. Mm -hmm. uh, the last paragraph, for those who are following, in Monday's lesson, it says, God has been pleased to communicate his truth to the world by human agencies. And he himself, by his Holy Spirit, qualified men and coached them to do his work. He guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. The treasure was entrusted to earthen vessels, yet it is nonetheless from heaven. Wow. Wow. Powerful words. It is, it is. And that will say to some people who will tell you that, guess what? Man wrote the Bible. I'm not going to trust in the Bible. There we have it. These words are deliberately entrusted to human instruments to write. And we can confide in these words and we can rest assured that God himself designed it this way. No matter the context in which they wrote, mm -hmm. It was God breathing his word through into them. Amen. Amen. And Tuesday, you alluded to this um, um, in Monday, but we'll get to it more directly. In Tuesday's lesson, we have the Bible as prophecy. We have some passages of scriptures here. The seven texts on the Tuesday, they are all about prophecy. But what I figured is that the one in Isaiah 53... Verses 3 to 7, that text actually, it tells us something that will happen, while the other texts tell us things that have happened or will happen. So prophecy is not just future, it can be fulfilled already. For example, look at John 14 verses 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. How can we how can we look at these are the direct words of Jesus? How can we look at this and tie it into the Bible as prophecy? Jesus said, I, I was going to Isaiah 53 to, 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 to we'll go back to that. We'll go right. back to that. But, but let's go to John 14, 1 to 3. Uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, passages, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, Bi the Bible says here, and Jesus is 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 the one that's that's speaking. Uh, in John 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You who believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, uh, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you would be also. Is that, is that prophecy? That is Prophecy. Prophecy in a direct way. Because it's Jesus himself who's speaking. Remember the context here. Okay? The context here is not really where it starts in John 14. If you read a little bit before, you would see the end of John 13. Jesus is in conversation with Peter. Peter said to Jesus, I am going to go with you everywhere. I will die for you. I'm going to be with you no matter what. And Jesus had to burst his bubble. Jesus had to tell him, wait, Peter, before the cock crows, you are going to say that you don't even know who I am three times. Let not your heart be troubled. Mm -hmm. So why you are planning to deny me, let not your heart be troubled. Why, while you are going to do something that would put me in problems, let not your heart be troubled. Why you, while you're going to say, I don't know the man, let not your heart be troubled. While you are against me, I'm saying to you. Don't you worry about it. I'm the God that's still going to go and prepare a place for it. 
<laughs> Beautiful word. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful thought to think that Jesus is speaking directly to Peter here. In earshot were all the disciples who could hear Jesus speaking to him. Let not your heart be troubled. And then he said to all of them, you who believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going to prepare a place for you. That's prophetic right there. Because Jesus is saying it to them and he's not even gone yet. So the prophecy here is direct. It's real. He is saying, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, you can, you can take it to the bike. I'm coming back again. It's the compendium of the Adventist theology. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I'm coming back. And the truth is, he is coming back. John, the same writer of St. John, is the same writer of the book of Revelation. And when we go to the book of Revelation chapter 1, we see here John tying it all together. In Revelation chapter 1, and I want to uh, read um, verse number I want to read John 1 I'm trying to get that verse of scripture where it says here okay 1 and I'm starting at verse number 7 he says look Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the peoples of the earth shall mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. Powerful words indeed. The same one who is writing in John 14, the prophetic word, is saying here in Revelation, look. It's happening. He's getting it directly from the God of heaven. I am coming again. Amen. How is this specific prophecy different from Isaiah 53? Verse 3 to 7. Well, let's go there. Isaiah 53. Verse 3 to 7. Okay. Let's take a look at it. The Bible tells us here, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he shall look upon our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Did I get it all right? Yes. That's yes, verse 5? Yes, yes, yes. And so we see here, this being different, in that this tells us what happened to Jesus. This tells us about the brutal murder of Jesus for our sakes. Mm -hmm. But then the one who was crucified is the one who got up on resurrection morning and he is the same one who conquered death, hell, and the grave and will be the one that comes again. So this is different in that it talks about what happened to Jesus. John 14 projects forward to what will happen, okay? So prophecy could go in the direction of the past as well as the future. Right, as seen in these two texts. Absolutely. So it's clear that, 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 that they are different based on one talking about past events and the other one talking about future. And it is happening from John's perspective. Remember, from Isaiah's perspective, this is yet future. Right, right. But from John's perspective, this would be past. And so John is looking at Isaiah, and he is at the same time projecting, based on what Jesus is saying, to the future time when Jesus will come again to redeem us from this earth. Great, great. So it is important that as we interpret the scriptures, we put the Bible 
in its context. We will, it's important that we look at the prophetic word and know that when we look at a certain scripture, we just can't say what we think it means, but look on the context in which it was written. That brings us to Wednesday, mm -hmm. the Bible as history. This confirms what I just said as it relates to the context. There are various contexts of the Bible. When you look at a text, it is important for you, in order for us to understand that text, we have to look at the historical context, the social, the religious context, the political, all of those. So, how is the Bible different from other history books like that I was studying in American history or West Indian history or Caribbean history? How is the Bible a different kind of history book? Because the Bible gives us history in relation to the salvation of humankind. Mm -hmm. It's called salvation history. So when we look at other history books, they can only give you history from the perspective of the past. The Bible, because it's the inspired word of God, and time is too restrictive to describe God, then we have a God that could give us words for future as if they were present. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at Daniel, and we just studied that last quarter, right? Daniel. Daniel chapter 1 to chapter 6 gives us rich history. When we look at Daniel chapter 2 and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar got, God was telling him in a dream something that was yet to be. And in doing so, he gave him a prophetic word that lined up with historical data. And when we look at it today and we study it, we see very clearly that it lined up with perfect accuracy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we have God that's in the picture. Regular history books don't have God in the center of its writing. Mm -hmm. And they're limited because they can only go so far. For instance, you and I could be powers. We can be parsed, just like you would parse a verb, okay? Let's take the verb to be. The word to be could be used as I was, I am, I will be. All of it coming from to be. Watch this. You and I, though, cannot use that in its future context without some help. For instance, I can say, yesterday I was at the grocery store. Today I am sitting on this set with a Sabbath school quarterly before me. Tomorrow, I don't know. <laughs> you could wish that you will be doing something but you don't know the only way that I can know is if I am in God and my future is in him then I can say tomorrow and if that tomorrow never comes in a literal sense I know that my tomorrow beyond the grave is secured because I'm in him amen and so the power of this is that we have to see that in our limitations, we cannot do predictive history like God can. Okay? And so our history is limited, mm -hmm. but when God speaks, he can run the gamut 
on the spectrum of past, present, and future mm -hmm. as if it was present. Right. And on another note, um, the Bible as prophecy. I like this because the the Bible as history. Sorry, mm -hmm. I like this because um, when you look at you can't understand the text unless you read the preamble, for example, or the passage. For example, there are books in the Bible that you have to go to the library to look at the background of the text. Josephus, you have to refer to his writing sometimes to understand certain texts. So when it says the Bible as history, this is very important because it helps us to interpret the texts right by looking at its historic, its historical context. Uh, absolutely. When, when we take a look at scripture, but then we see here that history is very, very important if we're going to understand the text. Mm -hmm. For instance, yes, yes, yes. for instance. When John wrote the book of Revelation, John was on the Isle of Patmos, a lonely isle, mm -hmm. an isle that didn't have running water, an isle that didn't have trees aplenty. It was a deserted, lonely, desolate place. As he was writing, John was overlooking the Dead Sea. And when you read Revelation chapter 21, you see it very clearly there. John said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully adorned for a husband. And then he continued on to say, and there was no sea. The historical context of that gives us a clear understanding of what John was literally meaning. John sitting down on Patmos overlooking the Dead Sea that separated the island from the other islands. He was saying that there would be no more separation when Jesus comes. You can't interpret that correctly unless you look into the history and see where John was and as he came out of vision, he is back into the world that he existed in and so he is writing based on what he is seeing. So he is getting the heavenly and he is interpreting the heavenly in the midst of his context and he longed to be with his people. And he's saying that on the day when Jesus comes again and that new Jerusalem comes down, we'll all be reunited. Remember, he is writing to the Jews in diaspora. They are scattered all around and he is inspiring in them some hope that one day this will all be over. We will no longer be separated. We'll be with Jesus forevermore. That's one instance where history is so crucial. In understanding, in understanding the, the text. Definitely. So it is surely important as we interpret the scriptures to bear in mind the historical context. Then this leads us to Thursday, the transforming power of the word. No, this is important. I've seen the word of God spoken on, and, and demons flee. Wicked, the wicked hearts of men transformed from, from ice cold to soft. I've seen sick healed, all of those things. What can you tell our viewers today, our listeners, about the transforming power of the word? Well, I will go right to the word itself and take Peter's story. Peter was one who denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter 
was one who stood by a fire and said, I don't know the man. When we get to the book of Acts, we see Peter being transformed by the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2, when the Bible says, and the day of Pentecost was fully come, and uh, the, the sound of a mighty rushing wind came through and filled up the house, and, 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 and cloven tongues of fire sat on their heads. We see Peter in that group transformed by the Spirit of God into an oracle for God. So the one who was once denying was now proclaiming. He stood up and he trumpeted the word of God so powerfully that over 3,000 souls were added to the church. When God's word transforms a person's life, the spirit of God indwells them and they can go forth and preach in the power and might of God's spirit. Not just that, but once after, Peter was on his way to the temple and as they were going up, he and John, the beggar was there. And what did he say? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. So he had to give him now what he possessed. Before he couldn't do it that way because he did not have that transformation that came through the word of God, through the power of the spirit. And then we see Peter moving around and his very shadow healed people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, 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 that's powerful. So we see a man who came from denying the word to the one proclaiming the word to the one whose very presence was imbibed by the word that he was able to heal. Transformation. And when I look at my own life, one who was a sinner, steeped in wrongdoing, mm -hmm. transformed, turned around, and now I'm declaring the word of God. Me? It's still a wonder. I still marvel at what God has done in my own life. So the word of God is powerful enough to change any circumstance any circumstance any situation okay give you a quick story just the other day i met an atheist lady and she was very very angry because she knew i was christian oh, i am a christian and she wanted to pretty much taunt my god and she said to me, Bane, this coronavirus is just one more in a line of evidence that tells everybody there is no God. Where is your God now? Two days later, one of her family members was dying from COVID-19. Atheist called me to talk about it. And without her knowing, in the middle of the conversation, she said, Oh God, my sister is dying. I said, What did you say? And she didn't even know she said, Oh God. And I looked at her and I said, there's really no scared atheist. Because anybody who's scared enough is going to call on the name of God. <laughs> so the transforming power of God is so pervasive that even an atheist could be in the midst of atheism 
and not even know when she said, Oh God. And so the word is transformative. She had no connection with the Bible, but she knew how to say, Oh God. Amen. <laughs> the word has the power to change, to melt the hearts of the roughest criminal the drug addict who has gone many years can be changed by the word of God it's a true fact now people have died for the word for example look at Fox as in Fox's book of Martin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and people have given their lives just to protect the word as 21st century Christians sitting here today, looking at this lesson, such a lesson like this, how should we esteem the Bible, knowing its uniqueness? And over the years, people tried to destroy it, but it still stands. It, and in the, in the lesson, it says, it says the Bible is extant, meaning it's still surviving, notwithstanding the many attempts to destroy it, to, 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 to take it away from the minds and the views of people. What can you tell the listeners? How can you tell us to, what advice would you give for us? The, the veracity of the Bible is what gives it validity. It's truth that cannot be Contradict. It's truth that lives as long as God lives. And I say to everybody listening today, hold up the Bible. It is God's words of truth and righteousness. Hold up the Bible. It is God's love letter to each one of you. Hold up the Bible. It is inspired by his presence. Hold up the Bible. You will find instructions in here toward holy living. Hold up the Bible. It answers all of life's questions. Hold up the Bible. And you will certainly find yourselves in heaven as a result of following its precepts. I love the man who gave his life for this word, a martyr by the name of John Huss. John Huss was being burned to the stake because of his belief in this word of God, the Bible. And as I read the history books about us, it came through glaring to me that this man had a deep and impassioned view of the word that he was willing to say, I will not recant my belief in the word of God. I will give my life. And while the flames of martyrdom were kindled about his feet, this man, because of his stern and stark belief in the word of God, was able to sing the shepherd's song in the midst of the flames of martyrdom. Powerful, powerful. Jesus himself followed the scriptures while he was on this earth. And so should we. If we abide in him and he is living in us, then we too will follow the words of God. Through his word, the written word, the living word. Mm -hmm. To wrap it up, I want you to leave three main points with our listeners or viewers today. From the lesson, what are three salient points you want us to take away from this week's lesson? Number one, Brother Dane, 
and viewers, the Bible is God breathed. That means that God placed his own breath into the writers of scripture, not just the physical breath, but he placed the breath of his word in each one of them so that we would be the beneficiaries of this word of God, the Bible. Number two, the Bible happened in the context of this world. We cannot take the Bible out of history and still have a correct interpretation thereof. So understand, that the word of God, even though God breathed, he used human beings in history to get his word out to other human beings for their benefit. And number three, the word of God is the transforming power that turns sinners to saints, evil men to evangelists, and drunkards to those who drill the gospel of Jesus Christ. I like the way you put that. Thank you for joining us today for this week's lesson. Continue to study the words of the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we read the word, it allows us to go and show the world the light that they may come and see how good God is. Thank you. Continue to study the word. The Lord bless you. Have a great day.